So thank you everyone for joining us on this panel. This panel is designed to be one of the most informative and action-oriented panels you'll attend. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of the real-time market research platform, Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands and agencies in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for insights that drive business growth. I'm joined on the virtual stage today by two powerhouse strategy leaders, and I'll let them introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Rachel. Sure. Hi, everyone. I am Rachel Berg. Um, I am a senior vice president of strategy um, at Velocity, um, which is the J and J agency at DDB New York. Um, I lead strategy on Neutrogena, um, skincare brand um, you're probably all familiar with, um, as along with um, Johnson's Baby. So, you know, leading, um, you know, strategy at the brand level, but also really kind of, you know, involved um, from start to finish in terms of kind of setting the stage for brand positioning to making sure that, that we tell our story throughout the, you know, entire um, consumer um, ecosystem. So responsible for all of that. Awesome. And how about you, Matthew? Hi, I am Matthew Bach. I'm a strategy director at Oberland. Um, I am responsible for driving brand strategies that will lead to greater purpose and greater profit for the agency's clients. Uh, we're focused at Oberland on brands with a positive social impact. Um, and so our work really focuses around purpose-driven brand strategies. Uh, that means any number of things. It means facilitating valuable research on platforms like Suzy, um, developing very potent communications plans, and also formulating insights that will lead to creative that really works. So really excited to be here today. I know it's kind of an, an interesting time to be discussing uh, strategy and insight development. So thanks for, for organizing the panel and, uh, and really excited. Awesome. So we'll get started with a couple of easy questions. Um, how has COVID-19 impacted the briefing and creative development process within your company? Rachel, we'll get started with you. Um, it could probably be summarized in one word, which is faster. Um, you know, I think when we all were sent home, um, we didn't almost know what to do with ourselves and kind of forgot how to do our jobs. And, you know, very quickly, uh, um, we had to kind of like learn to like kind of be flexible in a new environment. And so when I think about the, the briefing process, you know, all of a sudden, you know, instead of having a week to really kind of dive in and do the research that we wanted to do, you know, overnight, we had to really understand the landscape, how consumers were feeling that day, you know, translating into the tensions that we could solve as a brand and like, you know, brief next day. So I think the biggest thing I think for us is the speed um, with which we need to move. Um, and also just, I think, still the, the same level of quality that we needed to deliver. So that has probably been the biggest adjustment for us as an agency. Yeah, that makes sense. Are you seeing the same thing, Matthew? Uh, yes, definitely. There's definitely a need for speed and, and definitely a need to sort of get to, to uh, a perspective more quickly. I wouldn't say, though, that COVID has really changed the briefing process. Um, we still have the same brief format. The briefings are always still data uh, rooted in data and research. And, and actually, I would say that sort of initial strategic process might be one of the things that hasn't changed during this totally crazy, tumultuous time. Um, but I would say that COVID has pushed us as strategists at Oberland to think a little bit more deeply about what real sort of human problems or communications are solving for people. So we're being more sensitive, I think, to what people are experiencing in their daily lives. So issues of racial equality, of economic equality, these are more front and center for us. They're, they're less of you know an afterthought, and that comes through in how we think about strategy. So um, for example, we recently developed a new brand campaign for an educational institution that focused on this idea of creating space for people so that was obviously a nod to this feeling that so many people have of being confined and claustrophobic, not really letting their creative juices flow, um, but also that organization's commitment to creating spaces for groups of people that had been underrepresented in their field. So that yeah. didn't really come out of any alternative brief format or, or, or new sort of process, but instead it was just being a little bit more thoughtful and sensitive to people's mindsets and, and sort of the cultural topics right now, um, given current sensitivities. Yeah. For sure. A lot of our clients are doing a lot of work around empathy right now. And it really mm -hmm. seems to be uh, something that everyone's resonated with. So would you say that at your agency, is there somebody that owns the insights um, about your clients' customers? And really, what does that mean to kind of like own the insights? Rachel? 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think as with probably with most agencies, you know, you know, strategy really is like the owner of that, but it doesn't really stop mm -hmm. there. I think, you know, you know, I echo the sentiment in terms of the, as we have kind of been, especially as I think we think about kind of some adjustments into COVID, really thinking about people as humans, not consumers. And in order to be able to not only like to truly embrace that and understand the emotions that people are feeling like it has to be everyone's responsibility. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've always championed, but I think even more so now is really making sure that we all deeply understand where our consumer is coming from today. Strategy always, you know, will take the lead in making sure that we are the voice of the consumer. We are, you know, in the head of the consumer for the agency, but what we really try to do is, you know, partner with our creative teams, of course, um, really making sure that you know they they are in their heads as well, um, and you know, and our teams take a, you know equal ownership in that in terms of really understanding them and even kind of pushing us as strategists to like dig a le level deeper on the why sometimes um, you know as that we kind of dive into projects. So, but um, generally speaking, it is the, the strategy department's responsibility, but it's you know best executed when everyone makes it their responsibility. That's great to hear. Yeah, seconding Rachel, I mean, primarily the strategy team at Oberland sort of owns the insights about our clients' customers. I will say that our team is pretty cross-disciplinary, so um, creative directors will do their own research, account managers sort of have a pulse on things, and sometimes I help with some copy needs or manage clients, although that's not, you know, my... <laughs> um, but primarily it's the strategy team at Oberland that drives customer understanding, and that means a million different things. So. Um, it's a lot of it could be conducting proprietary research through Su Suzy, you know, for example, to help uncover that insight that leads to a resident brand platform. So, for example, recently for a women's med tech company, we uncovered on Suzy that there's a 7% gap in the number of women versus men nationally who say their doctor fully addresses their health needs. So the brand was shaped around sort of um, like equalizing that imbalance and in a really confident way. And, and we were really proud of how the work turned out there. Which um, way was the gap out of interest? Uh, so more men said that their doctor met their health needs than women did. Okay. So our team was like, that's not cool. And really like built a brand around sort of equalizing that. And we were proud of how that turned out. Um, yeah. So everything from, you know, really doing the research that gets us to a nugget that's powerful like that, for example, um, to doing all of the creative testing. And, and we found, um, you know, agile research platforms to be very useful for creative testing now, because obviously you can't do like conversations face to face and traditionally like focus groups, you know, um, have been very helpful for that reason. Um, and so those, those sorts of, of platforms allow us to get a read on whether or not a concept is resonating and why, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of take that back to the client and, and um, also help them understand how to improve the concept. So um, it means a lot of different things to sort of own insights about a customer, everything from their perspective um, in their lives to their perspective on a campaign, and, and our team is primarily responsible for that, so. Yeah, that's great. Obviously it's been quite a quite a year for uh, consumers. So have you, how have you been staying informed about this ever-changing consumer during COVID-19? Yeah, so I mean, what I would say is it hasn't really changed, I think, from previous um, kind of, you know, means in terms of getting, trying to get the consumer information. I mean, you know, we certainly um, we do a ton of social listening. We do trend monitoring. I think the most exciting thing that we have seen, though, in terms of, you know, research is that there's been a lot of free research available and a lot of companies have really been adapting to try to make sure, you know, we as strategists um, who are guiding brands through through this difficult time are able to kind of have access to more information than ever before. And so I think for, you know, us, you know, our kind of tactics in terms of like getting the research we want um, remain the same. Um, but it really has been like, you know, a really exciting time. I think every, you know, every day you get another report in your inbox for free, which is, I think, you know, something that has just been super, super helpful for us. I think the key, you know, thing as we start to think about staying informed, though, yes, of course, we have all those resources available to us, but really kind of staying in touch as a strategy group. You know, it's really easy when you're in the office together, you're all sitting around a table, you're you're having lunch, you're having coffee to like have those more casual conversations with about what's going on with consumers. And so what we've done at DDB, we've actually had twice weekly kind of just strategy department meetings to 
really just have conversation about what is going on and make sure that we're sharing across businesses. Because while I, you know, I work on, you know, a beauty brand, you know, other people work, um, you know, in everything from, you know, beverage to, you know, pharma. And so really kind of sharing and having that dialogue has been probably the most um, critical piece for myself in terms of really understanding the perspective of, you know, not only um, what other um, brands are going through, but what they they're, the people that they serve, what they're going through. And so that has been, I think, a key part of um, trying to kind of stay up with everything that's changing every single day. Yeah, the Insights community has really come together this year with a lot of free reports, a lot of free research. It's been really great to see how kind of collaborative everybody seems to have been this year. Yeah. Uh, how's that working for your team? Yeah, yeah. No, I was just going to second um, what Rachel said. I think there have been a lot of really interesting perspectives sort of floating around the internet, floating around LinkedIn that have been really helpful for our team. The other thing I would say is that um, one of the networks that I've tapped into during this time period is just my friend network, like reaching out to my friends and seeing sort of what their lives are like right now. So for example, I have a lot of friends who have actually permanently moved out of New York City who have made really, really serious uh, changes to their careers, even transitioning into an, a different career altogether. And that's how I know that, you know, some of the changes that we're experiencing, particularly with younger consumers, aren't just like temporary or, or, or you know, going to pass by really easily, but they're they're more serious and they could potentially be here to stay. So I think one of the things I always remind strategists is that like your friends are consumers too. So talk to them. So that's been really helpful. Um, what I would say that, um, you know, some of those um, broader studies that you find online and some, some sort of research that you can do through Suzy, for example, um, is helpful is to connect with people outside of your friend network outside of New York City. Um, you know, outside of the creative industries. So um, we've been running a series of sort of ongoing consumer research studies that have helped us get a pulse on consumer sentiment. Um, we've, been, we've done studies on shifts when it comes to the food and beverage landscape, um, which revealed that men are taking a more active role in cooking for their families and that people are looking for food brands to act more like holistic meal brands with recipe ideas and food enjoyment experiences. Um, we found that action surrounding racial injustice in another survey was newly seen throughout the country and not just on the coasts. So we're you know, taking a temperature check on these sort of important shifts that are happening with um, the Suzy platform and with other sort of research studies. Um, and that's very helpful. So coupling that with just conversations I've had with my friends and family members um, has been really helpful to get an overarching sense of things. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, obviously, from my accent, you can tell I'm from England, but lots of people have kind of abandoned London. My brother moved out and bought a house in the suburbs. A lot of my friends that live in New York, where I traditionally am, have moved out to Connecticut, Jersey, um, and so on. So yeah, those things are permanent. It's you know, the purchasing houses and purchasing um, bigger spaces. It's been really interesting to see. I think the suburbs are having a, a huge resurgence. <laughs> So how, um, one question I have is, uh, how do you traditionally empower the creatives with these insights? How do you share uh, those insights? What does that look like to help them during their development process? Rachel, we'll begin with yeah. you. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing that we always try to do, you know, as we are kind of building our kind of briefing sessions with the creative teams or just even kind of trying to shape a work session with them is ultimately just really making sure we're bringing to life um, the consumer and the human need. Um, and so bringing the consumer into um, our discussions and our briefings to really help them understand it. So, you know, that's where, you know, with Susie, I think it's been really fantastic because, you know, we've had to move much more quickly, like I stated before, but we're able to get real consumer insight, verbatims, understanding of like kind of how they are feeling to help inspire and fuel the creative. So while we might not be able to get into a traditional focus group setting, though I have done several um, Zoom focus groups over this the course of this time, um, it really is, you know, it's been a powerful tool for us to kind of bring them to life. Um, you know, also even, you know, to you guys talking to tapping into your networks, you know, actually, you know, speaking to friends and family who might actually be the consumer that we are trying to reach and having them record a video and bringing that in so our creatives can get a tangible sense of um you know what um these what what the 
from the, I guess, from the mouth of the consumer, hearing the insight from them. And so that's one of the things that, you know, we really try to do because at the end of the day, um, you know, people, they, you know, it's, 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 it's one thing to, I think, read something on a piece of paper, um, but really to actually see someone speaking and actually kind of feel the emotion and try to kind of just read body language and thinking about all of that, I think has been a really critical kind of added piece in terms of bringing the consumer and the insights to life. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. No, I, I would just second what Rachel said. It's, it's really fun to have the creatives in the room for the research if possible and to really work with them on shaping the questions. So, you know, they feel involved in the process. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that sometimes it's also helpful to like really, once you've done the research, just like sit with it, like let it sort of stew for a few days and then come back to the team with something that's very, very digestible and whittled down. Um, Cause sometimes, you know, in the past I've shared like, really large decks and really large, you know, output. And it, it can sometimes be hard for the creative team to wrap their mind around that. So I like to definitely involve the creative team in shaping the questions and being there for the research, but then also to like let the results sit for a bit and then check back in with like a more whittled down um, output. And so I think the way that, you know, research platforms like Suzy or Organize makes that easy because you can sort of choose what you're, you know, um, reporting back on. Yeah, that's great. It always reminds me of that very first episode of Mad Men where the market researcher delivers him that enormous book of insights. The minute she moves the room, he puts it straight into the trash can. <laughs> right, exactly. I've made that mistake before. Yeah. Very insights die a death in the middle of a PowerPoint. Um, so thinking about kind of internal disruption, you know, what I hear from my clients every day is that budgets are being cut and teams are being restructured, leaving you to do more, but with a lot less. Um, and, but also the businesses are engaging in this kind of far more iterative process as they develop new products, services, um, campaigns, and so on. So how have the needs of your strategist functions specifically changed in the last few months? And Matthew, we'll get you started on that one. Yeah, so I think really the biggest change is that we've had to become much more knowledgeable about ways to reach people. So about media, that was true before, but I think it's especially true now. So, you know, obviously an out of home campaign isn't going to capture the attention of as broad a swath of people as it had before. So we've really had to adapt to all things virtual and become more savvy when it comes to media, giving thought to formats like webinars. Um, we've done a ton of webinars for our brands and, you know, so you have to think about like, how do you structure them so they're not so static, but like more interactive and tailored to people's day to day lives. When are people seeing them? How are you promoting them? Those kinds of things. So you make them into the events that people want to attend and not just lectures. You know, how do you think about OTT and YouTube creatively? And so we're, we're bringing that thinking across our brands. Um, and I would say, that's one of the things that as a strategist now I've really been confronted with like, okay, I really have to think about how we're reaching people, not just what the message is. Um, and yeah, I, I just would say because most people are still spending so much of their time at home, that requires a lot of creativity, research and knowledge. So it, it sort of adds an interesting dimension to the strategist role. Yeah. Rachel, would you say the same? Yeah, I know. I, I definitely think that thinking about like those connection points with the consumer and which ones are going to be um, most impactful these days, I think that is definitely, I think, a piece of, of the process that, you know, is, is become heightened. Um, what I would also say is I think that as we think about kind of like how um, our roles have kind of evolved, you know, you know, and, and this is how my team has always been structured um, on my businesses. But I think, you know, actually having to understand more than just brand strategy or I'm a social strategist or I'm a digital strategist, you know, we're really seeing given um, what we were just talking about um, in terms of like knowing where to reach consumers and what are the most salient touch points for them. You need as a strategist to be able to think about solving the business problem um, if within the context of many different mediums. And I think, you know, the rise of the integrated strategists, while there still will be specialists, I think is going to continue to permeate because you just, you have to be flexible to be able to reach your consumer where you want to reach them. Um, and so you really, um, you know, it's forced us to really kind of learn new channels that we might not have paid attention to before, you know, myself, like on TikTok, or any of those other emerging platforms, like how do I think differently to reach my consumer there? And every, every strategist has to, has to know that these days. Yeah, it's a good point. So thinking of that kind of like iron triangle of budgets, timing and quality, how are you balancing that increased pressure um, really to, to do it faster, do it 
better, but also, you know, do it cheaper effectively. Rachel, is that something you're facing? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, co coffee and a little bit of balance is how I've been surviving it. Um, no, but I mean, I think, you know, more seriously, but yes, those things I think are part of it is, you know, while we are being asked to move quicker um, with nimbler budgets, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, for us, while we are much more iterative than we ever have been in the past, um, you know, it, it is about making sure that you do take the time out to allow yourself the time to think. Because I think, you know, I think some of the best ideas aren't born born overnight. It's like that that cultivation um, over the course of a few days, over the um, course of a week, where you really are able to kind of sometimes crack those really, really tough nuggets. And so really, I've, I've actually, for myself personally, I've blocked out my mornings um, so that people don't schedule a meeting without asking me purely so I can have that uninterrupted think time to be able to have that concentrated think space to be able to um, deliver a brief, a brief faster. I would also say, um, and I'm a I'm a perfectionist. Um, I for me, I, in a in a time in a place where you have to deliver the same quality, um, but faster. I'm also realizing that perfect is ninety percent, not a hundred percent. You know, I think that, and what I mean by that is, I don't wait until I have this perfect sheet of paper before I bring it to my creative director or before I even bring it to my clients. Sometimes I invite them into the process, um, and I think that has really really helped. Um, in terms of making sure that, you know, we are moving as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the ink is wet has probably been something I've said more in the last like few months than I have in my entire career. Yeah. So I, I do think that has been a key um, to helping me um, kind of navigate um, the quicker, more demanding timelines that we have to hit. Yeah. How about you, Matthew? Is the ink wet on a lot of your papers? <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And I also admire uh, Rachel blocking out time in the morning for herself just to think, because that's that's a good strategy. So I should adopt that for sure. Um, I would say um, Overland is kind of in an interesting spot because we have this niche in the market in terms of brands that are making a positive impact on the world. So um, it's it's kind of a self-selecting group of clients, and so. Um, I think that that's put us kind of in an interesting position uh, where, where we occupy a different space in the agency landscape. Um, but uh, we do have a very flexible sort of model. Um, so we, we can take on projects with different clients, you know, sort of custom tailored to their needs. It's not always the AOR bundle, which gives us an advantage. And that's um, sort of made things a little bit different from, you know, a, like a traditional agency at this point in time. Um, but genuinely having a research partner like Susie does also make a huge difference here because we've gotten instant responses to make, you know, decisions about campaigns, about our customers and about strategy. Um, and so when there's a lot of pressure on time and there's a lot of pressure on budgets, that can be really helpful just to say, okay, literally we got this read in two days and we recommend going with this and it's backed by data and, you know, we don't have to fret about this part of a specific brand's ask. Yeah. That's great. I was about to ask that question. Um, who have you found to be the best partner in helping you deliver these goals, both externally and internally? Matthew, what, a, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I've. <laughs> it sounds like I'm just propping up Susie a lot, but I yeah, thank you very have, much. Appreciate I'm, it. I'm aware of that, but I genuinely have had, you know, a a, a really um, a lot of success with the platform in terms of just being able to, to give clients a read on what's resonating and why, um, provide a temperature check on things like, okay, how willing are people to make trips to the doctor's office right now? How worried are they about germs? You know, those kinds of things that are like sort of outstanding questions that um, would take um, a traditional research firm a, long, a longer time and a lot more cost to answer. And we can get those questions in very quickly. So that's very helpful from a strategist perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to build upon that, I think, you know, from a, you know, from, from my seat um, at DDB, you know, I think that our research and data partners have been like, just so fantastic at this time. I think Suzy is not a platform actually that I used quite frequently, even though we had access to it, um, to answer uh, my clients' questions and get the, the, the quantitative data you need to, you know, be have confidence in decisions you're making. And so, 
that has been a, a newfound savior for myself in terms of really delivering on my goals. Um, in addition to, you know, our data partners like Kantar and Nielsen kind of you know, stepping it up and giving us more regular data because, you know, there is just a lot to figure out right now in terms of the dynamics of our businesses. And what I would say is, you know, internally, what has, I think, you know, working from home has really done for us as a North American strategy group at JDB. It's, it's like there aren't boundaries between offices anymore. So we have our New York office, we have our San Francisco office, and then in Chicago. And, you know, you've actually realized that you have this whole network of strategists across the United States that are now your partners in kind of, you know, solving your business problems. So we'll do, um, you know, we'll, we'll do a session where um, our teams can actually bring an open brief to the whole of the North American strategy group. And you, you have kind of the stage to ask the question like, how would you guys crack it? How are you thinking about this? So it really has kind of, um, kind of taken down the boundaries between the offices and given us like a more powerful network of strategic thinkers, which has been amazing and tackling some of the challenges that we've had to face on um, Neutrogena and Johnson's. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good point that it's kind of like broken down the barriers between offices and you're, you're not just relying on person sat next to you <laughs> and it's it's people from you know the other floors the other departments other offices and so on so actually Rachel you, you bring up a good point that um you know Susie obviously being a DIY platform when you first thought about DIY and the concept of DIY what were your initial reactions compared to working with agencies and, and how has that maybe changed in the last couple of months yeah, I mean, I think for myself personally, um, I thought it was going to be a lot harder to mm -hmm. um, get up and running and um, time consuming. Um, oh, like, how do I figure this this platform out? How am I going to do it? Um, and, you know, once you get in there, you realize how easy it is to kind of craft your survey and get it out there and get it out there quickly and get those results. And so I think it was just like kind of getting over that first hump of like, you know, diving in and jumping in and using it. Um, because, you know, we do typically, you know, on, you know, some of these larger CPG clients, you, know, you tend to do the longer, more laborious studies. Um, so it really, I think for myself personally, um, it I've like fell in love with it um, over the course of the last couple of months, because it really does um, help you get access to insight and data like so much more quickly than you could do with another methodology yeah amazing yeah i agree i think it also went from something that i might have thought of as like crafty or an add-on to something that was absolutely mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. like we all thought it was sort of a cool thing to do before to like bring additional value but now we really need it um because we're in this situation and because we can't do the face-to-face -face type of research that we used to do. So to start thinking of new ways to gain customer understanding has something, you know, has been something that my agency has definitely prioritized. And, um, and yeah, I, I think our perspective on it has certainly changed given these past yeah. few months. Great. And has, has, has it been able to help you support kind of more rapid decision-making, Matthew? Yeah. Um, and in particular, uh, for whittling down creative concepts, like we'll bring, you know, a, a bunch of different campaigns to the table to get a read on and then sort of come back with with one that really rose to the top and, and sort of have the understanding of why too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. And Rachel, has it, has it really helped you to kind of be more rapid with your decision making as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, especially, you know, when I think about like, we we really sweat the brief. Um, and so for us, it's been a, a really, it's just been a fantastic tool in really helping us to um, test multiple kind of strategic directions and get an understanding of what is the true consumer inside? How do we put it in his or her words? And so for us, it really has been a fantastic school a tool, excuse me, in, in driving strategic decisions. Um, so that's where it's been uh, most useful for me that we have started to test some creative within it, um, which the clients have been really excited about the rapid speed of those results as well. Amazing. So my final question, although probably the hardest question to answer um, of the session, is what advice would you give to other agency strategy leaders who are trying to bring the customer into their every conversation? Rachel, big question. <laughs> It, it, is, it is a big question. Um, you know, what I would say, you know, there's, I think there's a couple things. I think one, you know, I think that, you know, as we, we think about kind of 
going back to the office, thinking about where we are today. Like, I think that this, like this rapid pace and the speed of culture, which then, you know, kind of drives consumer behavior change is like, it's just never going to, it's not going to slow down. Um, and I think we're going to be in this place for a while where we need to consistently kind of stay, stay on that pulse. And so I think there's a couple of things in terms of delivering on that. I think one, just always remembering that like, and I think it's, we've always known this as strategists, but we haven't maybe we don't maybe always think about it this way, but how do we really kind of like continue to be proactive with our empathy and really thinking about p treating people like people, not consumers, like really making sure that we're, we're viewing these people as humans, um, making sure that we view our brands as problem solvers, not money makers. And so how do we think about like, you know, ways that we can then solve these problems that consumers are facing? And, you know, ultimately, especially given kind of everything that's going on in the world right now, like making sure that, you know, we are, are treating these things not like an assignment, but a way to make consumers' lives better. And I even say consumers, people's lives better. Um, and I think if we can just like, can, like, I think kind of carry forward the empathy that we've applied over the course of the last five months to our conversations, bringing the consumer into those discussions and thinking about them as people, I think, you know, we will continue to advance ourselves as, you know, in creating brands that, you know, people love um, because they're making a difference in their lives. Yeah, it's really about human understanding. Mm -hmm. sure. Matthew, do you have any final advice for other strategy leaders? Yeah, no, I, I would second what Rachel said. I would also say um, make fewer assumptions. Like nothing is what it used to be. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think people had a preconceived idea of the way the world worked. And that's very much being shattered across categories, across industries, and also in our sort of thinking about how to be sensitive to what people are going through right now. Um, and so I would say, Research, honestly, is more valuable than ever, no matter how you do it. Um, so keep doing it, keep asking questions, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll land somewhere relevant and true. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, this digital presentation is full of agency strategists who are going through a lot of the same changes that you guys are. Um, so I really hope everybody enjoyed our session today, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us.